Hi, I'm Susan Lloyd. Hi, I'm Keith Gosland, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Wednesday, June 26th, a day out of order for us, so who knows what might happen. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, and we acknowledge that this is unceded indigenous land. And with that, you you couldn't stay away, could you? I could not stay away. You, you but I want to say hi to Anne and Linda, who are off having fun without us. Uh, this seems to be a theme, Keith. Uh, but they're seeing parades. They're seeing all kinds of really cool plays they're, in New York City. Exactly. Jealous. And uh, they saw Suffs, which was from... Uh, from Vermont. Sh yeah. And she won Shania Tubb, two, who's from two Waitsfield. Three, Shout out to Waitsfield. Uh, she performed first in our theater, which oh, I'm a member really? of Valley Players Theater, so that right. was cool. So I'm glad you, you're enjoying your time. We're just picking on you. And speaking of picking on you, I'm going to start with the international news. Ah, go just, for it. Just bum us right out, get it over with. It's like ripping off the Band-Aid. Right? Give, give us the balance of yeah. there's so much yeah. that our communities are subjected to. Mm. We need to appreciate all of it. Yes. So the first item that I have. <clears throat> The Pope, did you hear about this one? I feel mm -hmm. like, stop me if you heard this one. The Pope repeats a gay slur in a closed door meeting. The Pope has again, this has happened before, used a highly disparaging word against gay people for which he had already apologized last month. I was gonna say, th this, this happened we've, another we've, time. I was gonna say, we've yeah. reported on it and yeah. he did it yet he again. He did it again. They said on Tuesday, uh, he, they had attributed to the Pope the use of the word fracchion. I can't pronounce it. I apologize to the Italians in the audience. It's an Italian term roughly translating as faggotness. That is so rude. On mm -hmm. May 20th, during a, and then so he met again. And what he said was there is an air of faggotness in the Vatican. Does that mean and it's he festive of <clears throat> it has not, good taste? That is not the context. Oh. But he then went on to say it was better that young men with a homosexual tendency not be allowed to enter the seminary. Hmm. But here's something more upbeat. Thailand yes. finally yes. passed the same-sex marriage law. So I have two kind of related stories here. So on June 18th, uh, Thailand Senate passed the final reading of a marriage equality law paving the way for it to become the first country in Southeast Asia to recognize same-sex couples. The bill was a culmination of more than two decades of efforts by activists, and it was supported by an overwhelming majority of lawmakers in the upper house. The law needs royal approval, which, and will come into force 100, that's, can we give the royal name? <laughs> that means Keith and I approve. <laughs> well, there you go. Done. Next problem. Uh, 120 days after it's uh, published in the Royal Gazette, meaning that the first same-sex weddings could take place later this year. Today we celebrate another significant milestone in the journey of our equal marriage bill, Thai Prime Minister Saretta Tavison said in a post on X. We will continue our fight for social rights for all people regardless of their status. This is a monumental step forward. Thailand would be the first to enact marriage equality legislation and the third in Asia after Nepal and Taiwan. In a related story, uh, a Thai lesbian couple, Vorawan Ramwan and Anticha Sangchai, have been waiting patiently for the passage of the same-sex marriage law so they can cement their relationship after four years together. Now they will be able to get their marriage license and... What else? <laughs> you know, Southeast Asia, I have a lot of mm -hmm. friends that go there. Have you ever been there, Bangkok? Mm. Uh, it's known for its vibrant cultural scene and tolerance has long been a popular destination and for LGBTQ. sex trade. There is some sex trade. That's the downside, uh, depending on your perspective. Thousands of revelers, though, turned out and activists gathered for a parade through the streets, joined by the prime minister, who came dressed in a rainbow shirt to celebrate Pride Month. That's cool. I like that. And for Ms. Anticha and Ms. Vorawan, marriage equality represents more than just a ceremony. It is a marker that their relationship is recognized and granted the same legal protections as heterosexual couples. And they said, 
The passage of this law is a social movement pushing the boundaries by acknowledging our existence. The law formalizes their ability to look after one another legally and will give us more of a sense of security for our lives, which is something we've never had before. It's very exciting. In Kiev, in the Ukraine, hundreds gather for a war-shrouded pride march. I saw that. Under the pouring rain and overshadowed by war, Diana Ivanova joined the few hundred who gathered on Sunday for the Ukrainian capital's first pride march since the Russian invasion, guarded by a heavy police presence. Shortly after Ivanova and other participants dispersed after a brief rally that took place behind a police cordon, that doesn't sound very festive. Nationalist militants set off for counter demonstration through the streets and shouted homophobic slurs. Bastards. The opposing rallies took place more than two years into the war, which is often portrayed as an existential fight to join European liberal values, though some of the Ukraine remains deeply conservative. Even through the attacks, we need to come and show up. We are such a country, such a nation, that we don't give up. If our rights are taken, we fight for them, said 27-year-old Ivanova. That's kind of nice. She contrasted the situation in Ukraine with that of Russia, where the Kremlin has accelerated its repression of the LGBT yeah. community, community since launching its full-scale invasion in 2022. Here's good news. Gay sex ban in Namibia ruled unconstitutional. I'm See? not going to Namibia anyway, <laughs> but that's okay. I was just gonna say, that's, that's our running joke, right? We're creating a list of yep. places. No, you're not going, okay. No, no. In a landmark ruling for gay rights campaigners, laws banning same-sex acts between men have been ruled unconstitutional in Namibia. Convictions for the colonial era offenses of sodomy and unnatural sexual offenses were rare, but fueled discrimination against gay men who lived in fear of arrest. No laws exist prohibiting sex between women. So see, we could go. Well, you could go, but you don't want, they have other things we don't like I think going on. Yes. Marrying someone of the same sex is still illegal in the Southern African nation. But if a same sex couple weds abroad and one of them is not a Namibian citizen, their union is legally recognized. That's odd, it's usually kind of the other way around. There are some countries that if your marriage civil union happens someplace else, they'll recognize it, but they're not going to officiate for it in their country. Okay. After Friday's judgment was read out at a high court in the capital, a Windhoek campaigners for the LGBTQ group Equal Namibia shared photos of people hugging in court. Welcome to a new Namibia, a born free Namibia. Is that where that was filmed? Born free? I, I digress. I, I digress. Yeah. The group said on social media, the term born free was most famously used in neighboring South Africa to describe the first generation of children growing up in the dawn of democracy after white minority rule ended in 1994. I no longer feel like a criminal. The court case was brought by a Namibian activist called Friedel Dasov with backing from the British charity Human Dignity Trust. I, it won't be a crime to love anymore, Mr. Dasov said, reacting to the verdict. I no, no longer feel like a criminal on the run in my own country simply because of who I am. Summing up his emotions, he told the Reuters noise a, news agency he was just just happy. The UN has also applauded the ruling, calling it a powerful step towards a more inclusive nation that would also improve access to health services and HIV treatment. Fearing a backlash to the ruling, the rights group Amnesty International is urging the Namibian government to ensure the safety and dignity of all LGBT people. There have already documented instances of alarming and threatening speech in the country mm -hmm. during the run up to the court case. Namibia, first colonized by Germany, gained independence from South Africa in 1990 after a protracted war. Several nations in Africa have repealed anti-LGBTQ laws in recent years, but South Africa is the only country where same-sex couples can marry and adopt. That's my international Thank overview. You, Over to you. Mandela. Huh. So yeah. So. Trivia, and she was so close. Ugh. She was, but but she said she did wasn't living in Vermont. <laughs> and Keith didn't give me any any points for that. Nope. 
I gave you some. I said partial credit. So front page out in the mountains, June 1992. The story recounted legislators being subjected to hate mongering, threats against the members and their families, as well as finding defaced and or burned American flags on their porches. One senator was threatened by a constituent who stated they would be back with a gun. What was this in response to? So looking at events, Rainbow Umbrella, the women's discussion group, book discussion group, if you're interested, go onto the Facebook page. All of the you know, contact detailed information will be available. And I'm told the, discussion, the women's discussion group is meeting in person now. It's not a Zoom call. Coming up in August, and we're promoting it now, Saturday, August 17th, the Queer Arts Festival is coming back to Plainfield. Now, last year, this had to have been the queer event of the summer. Anyone who knows Plainfield, the festival happened on the rec field, but people were parking as far away as the Goddard campus and walking to attend. And the reason we're promoting it now is they're looking for vendors. Mm -hmm. Are you an artisan? Are you a performer? Mm -hmm. you know, do you have you know, a nonprofit that you would like to promote? Oh, nice. Is there an initiative <clears throat> that you would like to get people to join in on? So will so, there be singing and dancing and those kinds of things? There'll be, and, and food vendors, there will be. That's what, that was my next question. Well, I was will say, there be snacks, Keith? The, <laughs> I'm very food motivated. You don't have to bring <laughs> snacks. <laughs> nice. The use of the term festival in its broadest sense is what they're aiming for. Mm. And we will make sure that the contact information, if you're interested in being a vendor, is available during this broadcast. But there may be an interview coming up with the Ooh. organizers where you could get more details. Nice. Mosaic, the sexual violence program in Barrie, on July 16th and 17th is their next installment of Let's Talk Sex. And this is for teenagers. And it's to talk with them about all of the things that all of the other states are trying to keep our youth from hearing and knowing, and it's how to negotiate and consent, hmm. and how do you build and maintain relationships. This is not just a sterile mm -hmm. tab A into slot B kind of. Mm -hmm. This is really talking about all the things we wish somebody had told us when we were kids. Mm -hmm. And Bennington, Sunday, June 30th, is finally their pride parade and block party. Mm. Our previous shows, events was who was doing what on what day and keep in mind White River Junction, their pride event is not until July and it's a week long, the 20th through the 27th. And they are organizing and their events are going to be geared toward a community public response to the bomb threat for Drag Queen Story Hour last year. Mm -hmm. So be on the lookout for that. A reminder, the Pride Center is having their annual health and wellness survey. Takes 10 to 15 minutes. It's an online survey. And this is what informs them mm -hmm. as they're looking at what are the priorities for the, years, the year coming up? What are the programs that are being requested that they don't provide? What can they enhance? So they truly do use this. Thursday, July 4th, if you're on Lake Champlain and West Addison, the Barbs want you to come for a picnic and a family event. Your dogs are welcome. Nice. It's 300 feet of prime waterfront, two rides, boat rides, <laughs> Fun floaties, <laughs> swimming, paddle boat, canoeing, kayaking. I thought you said two brides. <laughs> I don't Whatever. Know. I don't know. But no, bring your favorite dish, dessert to share. You're Have a good dish. time. You're my favorite dish. There you go. Thank you. Where on the lake is it again? Um, West Addison. Oh, okay. So by it's the three, above, 306. Fisher Point Road. Okay. 
Mm, so, and great. there, I think we have a poster to put up too. That's nice. Great. Uh, Saturday, July 13th. And I'm told this is a recurring event. The second Saturday of each month at Babes and Bethel, mm. the queer dance party. Nice. From eight until midnight. Mm. Come show us what you can do. Mm. The Fletcher Free Library has started an LGBTQ plus book group. Oh, I love that. And they are, they've got five books. It's in local history, their local history room, that's the name of it, from 11 to 12 on the final Saturday of each month. They have been reading Red, White, and Royal Blue. Oh, I read that. The next one is going to be How Far the Light Reaches, mm. and that will be the June 29th discussion. Confessions of the Fox, a July 27th, Light from an Uncommon Stars on August 31st, and Everyone on the Moon is Essential Personnel, September 28th. And that's in person at the library. That's Burlington. in person. Okay. That's your, the local history room. Wow, right? cool. As opposed to creating local history. <laughs> and this is, you know, a sort of upcoming July 8th through July 14th is Non-Binary Awareness Week. Wow. And it culminates with July 14th being Non-Binary Awareness Day. Hmm. And in the week that surrounds Non-Binary People's Day, it is used to raise awareness and celebrate the diversity of gender identities that exist outside the traditional gender binary. So I have not seen any events that have specifically been organized here in Vermont, but we will keep an eye out for things that may come up. Hmm. And with that, you've you've got some you know national stuff that you're I you're just do. itching to tell me. I do. Uh, so Sarah McBride, as you heard about that, have you heard yeah. about this? She is pretty much assured of being the first transgender person in Congress because she only had one opponent who dropped out. That's the best way to get it. <laughs> and She's a state senator currently. Uh, she's running for the sole seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. So that's exciting. I like that. Uh, this just made me chuckle the headline alone. Representative Robert Garcia said, the army that defeated Hitler and saved the world included drag queens. And he made an impassioned speech that <laughs> And okay. referenced all of the USO shows and Bob Hope oh, and people true. dressing in drag, you know? Exactly. So all these people came onto bases during the war. It was fine then. Why we got to kick people out of the libraries and be unkind? Hold, uh, he, hold on to that veterans theme for... Oh, I know. We, there's a couple of veterans. Yeah. Right? Uh, he's, uh, he said, Mr. Speaker, drag is art. Drag is culture. Drag is creativity. Drag is comedy. And no, drag is not a crime. It's not pornography, Garcia said. The real obscenity is when one of our colleagues, the gentlewoman from Georgia, shows literal posters of revenge porn in our oversight committee. If we want to end porn in government, let's ban that. Did you hear that she showed naked pictures of Hunter Biden the, or something? Yeah, there, oh my there's goodness. nothing gentle about that person from no, Georgia. No, I think he was being sarcastic. Uh, Kamala Harris pro hosted a pride reception. Yeah. That was exciting. She and the first gentleman hosted a vibrant Pride Month reception at the Naval Observatory, where a message was clear. While progress has been made, there are still people looking uh, to take back LGBTQ rights. The event fell eight years after the massacre at Pulse Nightclub in Orlando, uh, which claimed 49 lives. It remains one of the deadliest mass shootings in US history. I thought this was interesting. There's no film like The Wizard of Oz. They're making a documentary, and they're really highlighting the LGBTQ angle of inclusiveness. So it's, it really? has long been beloved by LGBTQ audiences, and anyone who ever wanted to go over the rainbow, Keith, and maybe not come back, you know, I'm just saying. 
it's a small number of movies that really deserves the, the title of iconic. So a group of people have gotten together and they're gonna feature interviews with a diverse group of Oz aficionados, including drag queen Ginger Minge, do you know Ginger, <laughs> Ginger Minge? A wicked author and some um, kids of the original stars. Oh. So that'll be really interesting. Uh, and Ginger, the drag queen said, we just love someone who bears the weight of the world and remains fabulous despite that. it all. Minge says in the press release, commenting on the LGBTQ plus community's love for Judy Garland. Many of us relate to her because we've been told we're too fat, not pretty mm. enough, or don't sing well enough. Any criticism imaginable was thrown at this young lady, Judy Garland, and yet she still became a shining star. So I'm looking forward to that. I love yeah. that angle to it. Uh, in the Olympics, half, I feel like now we're counting people, counting gays here. Half of the U.S. basketball team is our lesbian, uh, are out lesbians, as are several other coaches, making them the gayest team at the Olympics. I think we're that we have know to of. It's the dikeiest team. <laughs> that we know of. Yeah, yeah dikeiest, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but in other news for the Olympics, uh, transgender swimmer Leah Thomas uh, mm -hmm. lost their battle. They are out of the Olympics yeah. after losing the legal battle. That's really contentious. That's a really tricky thing to navigate. That's, People are so, you know, it's very polarizing, right? That's where our opposition <clears throat> has focused, so that's the battle. Now, did you, did you have anything around the Biden administration with LGBTQ students? No. Was that no. part of your, okay. Uh, so a federal judge in Texas said the Biden administration improperly attempted to rewrite a federal law bar barring sex discrimination in schools by applying it to LGBTQ students. So that was that's problematic, and they're going to obviously Texas, huh? appeal. Texas, go figure. Mm -hmm. But Massachusetts, it was ruled that they could, in fact, ban a T-shirt that says two genders. A school district in Massachusetts was within its right to ban a student's There Are Only Two Genders T-shirt as protecting LGBTQ plus students from harassment overrides free speech consideration a federal appeals court has ruled. It's because Massachusetts has a statute of, against creating a hostile and disruptive environment. Mm. And that was the basis for which the judge mm. said you were totally within mm. your purview. That. Yeah. Uh, so they're following the lead of other courts that have grappled with similar cases and emphasizing that in many realms of public life, you have to bear the risk of being subjected to messages that are demeaning of race, sex, religion, or sexual orientation, even when those messages are highly disparaging. San Francisco declares itself a transgender sanctuary city. Well, we could have seen okay. that one coming, right? I'm uh, shocked. They have officially designated the city as sanctuary. A growing number of municipalities and states have taken a similar stance. The Board of Supervisors unanimously voted 11 to none at its June 11th meeting to adopt a resolution. Oh, now this, you got to see this if you haven't seen it. This is the popcorn. Uh, get out our popcorn. Have you seen Outstanding, A Comedy Revolution? It's a documentary about out comics, stand-up comedians, comedians and comedians. It's on Netflix. It's an epic chronicle of trailblazing queer stand-up. I just stumbled across this about a week ago, and, and I was sucked in. The history of entertainment is a lot like the history of almost everything else. It's been marred by generations of bigotry and oppression. The new documentary celebrates 100 years of queer humor, highlighting important icons and movements, and painfully illustrating how every time social progress is made for the LGBTQIA plus community, there's a horrifying conservative backlash yep. that sets the movement back decades. So he assembled a small army, army of queer comedians for the film using the backdrop of the standout and LGBTQ plus celebration. Do you remember this? Yes. In LA in yep. 2022. So there's clips from that, but then he interviews the, the, the folks that were involved in putting that on. So he got... Um, Sandra Bernhard, Lily Tomlin, Margaret Cho, Susie, Eddie Lizard, uh, Izzard, sorry, <laughs> not Lizard, Wanda Sykes, Judy Gold, Scott Thompson, Marsha uh, Warfield, Trixie Mattel, Mae Martin, Patty Harrison, Fortune Feimster, to name a few. And it was uh, very um, 
it was very well done. The sense of camaraderie was forged by their shared history. So they talked to Rosie O'Donnell and people about what it was like to have her talk show yep. and be in the closet. And, and there's a clip where she's talking to Ellen after Ellen came out and she said that it was, I'm giving it away, sorry. But she makes this comment along the lines of, I wanted to support Ellen, but I was putting my own talk show potentially at risk so they, they started talking about Ellen being Lebanese or something, and everybody knew what they were actually saying. <laughs> so, there, was you know. one of, there was one show that Rosie had Kate Clinton on, mm. and the word lesbian was never mentioned. Yeah. How do you interview yeah. Kate Clinton? Yeah. But, yeah. but they also had some really cool archival footage of people like in the 50s, yeah. and these two women, I'm forgetting uh, their names, they were a couple, and they had a show briefly on TV, and they got kicked off sort of in the era of um, the Smothers Brothers and Sonny yeah. and Cher, I think it was in the 60s. Um, oh, in Colorado, uh, Autumn Scardinia uh, is a transgender woman. She's suing a baker for refusing to make a cake to celebrate her gender transition. Didn't we Col have this a couple years ago Colorado in Oregon? Colorado and cakes. I don't know what their obsession. Two cakes. Are. He refused to bake a cake, and he's been sued, and the case uh, involves the state's anti-discrimination law, mm -hmm. refusing to provide services. Um, what else? Let's see. The ruling by the three <laughs> judge panel was, we concluded that creating a pink cake with blue frosting is not inherently expressive and any message or symbolism it provides to an observer would not be attributed to the baker. <laughs> okay, so who's, who's representing the plaintiff in this case? Oh, I don't know. What does it say? Oh, the defendant. Excuse me. Uh, la, 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 la. What does it say? It doesn't say. Because the he partially prevailed before the Supreme Court back in 2018, and was later sued. Scared. Oh, oh, the uh, the transgender woman is an attorney. So. Oh, okay. Go her. No, I was thinking of who is representing I the cake baker. I'm not seeing the the cake baker's attorney. Because when the, our, when the U.S. Supreme Court made their previous rulings about Colorado and artistic inspiration, cake baking, whatever, they were very limited decisions. Mm. So. Uh, a federal judge is renewing their threat to sanction top LGBTQ right lawyers. Um, District Judge Lyles Burke renewed his order for some of the nation's top civil rights attorneys to produce a privileged document or face sanctions. He ordered 11 attorneys involved in a lawsuit against, guess, oh, red state, Alabama's law, criminalizing gender-affirming care to produce a privileged Q&A document. Oh, it sounds like they're just fishing for confidential information about people. Zane Phillips, do you know who Zane Phillips is? I know the He's name. He's an actor. It says that he wasn't uh, able to come out until he began recognizing how fun it was to be gay. <laughs> I just love this article. He went, really? to, a, he went to a summer camp. Uh, he lived in Texas, so he probably didn't have a lot of strong role models to, in, the, in the gay department. But he uh, finally began to accept his being gay when he moved to that small town in Texas and went to a local theater camp. That was the first time I met a number of other queers around my own age. Of course, I wasn't out at the time, but there are a couple of guys who were, and I remember being drawn to the way that they carried themselves, and it was their openness that let him experience queer joy in a way he had never before. Beyond that, it let him reconnect with his masculinity after feeling that he didn't fit in with his heterosexual peers. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, you're going to talk about the military. I think mm -hmm. this is a slight variation on that in um, pardoning people. No, that just happened today. Okay, should I say? I, gra I grabbed it. Oh, you did grab that. Yeah. The p pardoning piece. Yeah. Okay, so I won't. I'll save that for you. Um, this was disturbing. The rise of queer Republicans. They're on the rise. Why? Why? I don't know. More Americans feel comfortable coming out, and that doesn't mean they're all progressives. Again, why? <laughs> Every Pride Month, the rainbow flags come out, part parades march on, and if it's an election year, Democratic candidates make their appeal to a growing part of the electric, ele electric LGBTQ voters. But there are a growing number of Republican LGBTQ folks. 
the Republican Party has generally oscillated between outright aggression and disgruntled passivity toward the LGBT community, but the Democratic Party has moved rapidly in the last two decades from mere tolerance to active advocacy. But the more distant past provides important context. It explains why gay and queer people exist in both parties and across the political spectrum today, how conservative and Republican LGBT people played influential roles both in efforts to gain protections and in shaping the modern Republican Party. And this is a part of our community that's often overlooked. Do you have a thought on it? I was really disturbed when I read this. <laughs> During the early days of organizing here in Vermont, we reached out to what was then the Log Cabin Society, yes. which were um, gays who identified within the conservative and the Republican political perspective. Yeah. But since then, and, and we had a very difficult time because some of the legislation we wanted to do was running contrary to you know, mm -hmm. their sort of personal beliefs their about how, yeah. how far you, you could or should go. Yeah. But I was going to say, you know, recently the Republican Party on a state-by-state -state basis have had very hostile anti-platforms. Yeah. So I'm kind of surprised. And in yeah. the South, they have you know, publicly kicked the queer Republicans out. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. Yeah, that's real surprising. Uh, the Supreme Court is going to decide if states can prohibit hormones for transgender teens. The Supreme Court said Monday it will hear a major case on transgender rights and decide whether states may prohibit the use of puberty blockers and other hormones for teens who suffer from gender distress. The justices have not ruled on whether discrimination based on gender identity is unconstitutional. In the last three years, many Republican-led states have enacted laws that forbid medical treatments intended to help youths under 18 transition to what the measure describes as purported identity inconsistent with the minor's sex. The Biden administration, ACLU, and Lambda Legal urged the court to hear cases from Tennessee and Kentucky to rule discrimination against transgender youth violates the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection of laws. They argued that a law targeting transgender individuals for disfavored treatment is a form of sex discrimination and should be struck down as unconstitutional. The court said it would hear arguments in the fall on the Tennessee case. We're grateful that transgender youth and their families will have their day in the highest court, said Tara Borelli, senior con counsel at Lambda Legal. Without action from the court, these punitive categorical bans on the provision of, provision of gender affirming care will continue to wreak havoc on the lives of transgender youth and their families. And this one family said it's really hard to overstate the difference in their daughter's medical treatment, when it, the difference it's made in her life and their family. And parents are often involved in this uh, legal challenge. And what this one uh, mom said was before coming out and starting to receive this medical care, their daughter struggle just to make friends and keep her grades up and be in school and, and even accepting hugs from her family. And now they have a confident, happy daughter who's free to be herself. And she would like the judges to see and understand her daughter and recognize her rights under the Constitution like any other person. NCLR is also actively involved in the litigation and bringing this to the Supreme Court level. Here's another slightly controversial thing. Sean Penn, remember him? He played Harvey. Mm -hmm. He's mad at this backlash against straight actors playing gay in film. And like, part of me says, I have no, <laughs> I have no sympathy for you because you get all these things. Just you have so much privilege in your life. But uh, he says that uh, this culture that we've got now is timid and artless <laughs> toward the human imagination feeling that he can no longer play a gay role. He blamed the cultural climate on casting issues. He said it would be currently impossible for him to play the part of a gay man as he did in the 2008 film Milk. Uh, he was speaking to the New York Times about his entire career and responded to a question if he would now be able to play Harvey Milk, the role for which he won a Best Actor. He said uh, that playing Milk was the last time I had a good time on a film set. I'm not going there. You can't. I was going to say it. It could not. not. Not nothing about me without me. 
I, yeah. 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 Um, I think that's it okay. for me, Keith. I, I did kind of a speed, speed read. It's okay, and we'll see what we have for time. Oh, we can we, just check. We, okay, so I don't have it in front of me, but Sunday's Times Argus mm -hmm. had a very interesting editorial. Okay. And it was detailing community organizing that's happening in Rutland. And it's people who were concerned about their community and safety. Mm. And thinking, think back to when it was the neighborhood watch programs, mm -hmm. only they're saying these groups are taking on more of a vigilante feel. <clears throat> and rather than mm. trying to reach out and work cooperatively with law enforcement, that law enforcement have had to remove them from active scenes so that they could then respond to what was happening and do their jobs. Now, the reason mm. this editorial was written is they're seeing the same activity happening in Barrie. And their huh. question is, what is the intent? Mm. Where is this going? And since most of this organizing happens in social media. There's no oversight. Mm -hmm. There's no controls on what's happening. And who knows what their intent might become. Makes, makes me nervous yeah. at best. But So this is an update. What is Be the rhetoric? Like, I mean, what are they saying it, on social media? Well, is no, it, it's very, you know, is it protect homophobic? Is it? Protect our communities. I mean, that's those vague. people. Those people, and oh, those but people. Now, now, keep. But keep in mind, what mm -hmm. I had said is this is on social media, right. so we don't really have access to it. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the rhetoric is, mm. because if you're not part of the but, social group, you don't have access. But are to they what walking the streets like yes. thugs? And we don't. The know. the indication from the editorial is that at least in Rutland, yeah, they were going out wow. as a group and. Mm. So it's something for us to be attentive. Wow. Mm. Now we haven't talked about this in actually quite a while. Fern Feather, oh, the yeah. trans person who was murdered in Mooresville <gasps> in, in 2022. A couple years ago, right? Yeah. 2022. There has been an update Apparently, the state's attorney has recently received additional information. Mm. The defense wants to bring in a new expert witness. So this is going to push any potential trial back at mm. least an additional six months. Mm. So this family, friends, extended network who has been looking for some kind of resolution, nothing's happening immediately. Do we know who the special witnesses we know or what we the, know nothing no. other than mm. the state's attorney said they had additional information mm. the additional evidence that they needed to review mm. and the defense said we want to bring someone else in nothing further was disclosed mm. which from our previous prior backgrounds mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. and you know but this is what um, the state's attorney also said that an additional hate crimes charge which has been a conversation, mm -hmm. is probably not forthcoming mm -hmm. because they couldn't find the necessary evidence mm -hmm. to be able to add it or prosecute it. The family said that no matter when the court date is, it's not going to stop the hurt, the wanting him to be here. It's not going to stop ruining every holiday. It's mm -hmm. not going to stop anything. They said that they can only remember who Fern was, mm -hmm. a youth counselor, world traveler, lover of animals, and the outdoors, and of people. He loved easily, and he loved hard. Mm -hmm. so, so our legislature was busy in their one-day override session. They overrode six of seven vetoes. Yes. And the one that we were watching the most was H-72, and this is the bill that had originally been introduced by Taylor Small mm. that included in, in the provision 
would be the creation of an overdose prevention center in Burlington. Mm, nice. And Mayor Mulvaney Stanick has already said, we're actively working on how can we do this, where it should be located, and sort of the oversight that will be involved in ensuring that we are actually providing a community resource. Nice. So that is good. So there's been another LGBTQ plus candidate that's announced that they'd like to run for office. And they're running for the Vermont Senate, the Chittenden Central District, and we're promoting it now because there are three incumbents who are all running for re-election. Mm. So this person is coming outside of mm. the incumbents. And I Outside the, of their party? Hold, hold, hold on to it. No, hold just on, the three incumbents. Hold on to that thought. <laughs> because I was going to say <laughs> this would be the Democratic yes. primary for the statewide primary that's happening on Tuesday, August 13th. Mm. And if you're interested in hearing why Stuart Ledbetter Ooh. is running for the Senate, you may want to watch our next interview show. Nice. So, so also in the city of Burlington, and speaking of those lovely oppositions, the nonprofit group Restoring Inte Integrity and Trust in Elections. I already hate them. I'm already <laughs> suspicious. Well, wait till you find out who the two founders were. Oh, dear. Former U.S. Attorney General William Barr. Oh, dear. <laughs> and political consultant and activist Carl Rove. I thought you were going to say Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> and Carl Rove. Carl Rove. They're bringing suit against the city of Burlington for their, um, where did I lose my place? About um, elections, non-citizens being able to vote in local elections. <sighs> I mean, this is the same so, suit that was brought against Winooski and Montpelier when we amended our charter, and the state constitution dismissed the case saying, because they were using a Vermont constitutional argument, saying that this would deprive you and I of our vote because we're giving someone who is a non-citizen that... And our Supreme Court said that because it is only local, not federal or statewide elections, it is permissible. But they're going ahead with the suit anyway. And the last two suits against Winooski and the city of Montpelier were brought from within the Republican Party. My yeah. question was, is this a national organization that yes. has set up shop in Burlington just to be, just the, to challenge the, this particular well, piece of... No, oh, no, 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 this, this is, they are truly going after anything election related. Okay, but it's a national organization, it is a national, so they're not based the, in Burlington, they're just poking at Burlington because they think they found the soft underbelly of something. To, well, no, we're, not, Vermont, as we have said on previous shows, the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Heritage Foundation, yeah. this new group, they've got their, they've got their eyes on Vermont. <sighs> And part of it is, you know, the Alliance Defending Freedom, part of their strategy is we don't necessarily think we're going to win outright, and, and actually we hope we don't, because we want this to be elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court level so we can take what is a local or Vermont-based issue and make it a national-level decision, mm. such as taking up the case about transgender. Mm. I have concerns mm -hmm. that... We do not have a favorable court. Right, and there'll be a and federal response to a state situation. But what we need to look at is the U.S. Supreme Court and their rulings that should be coming out this week about federal law trumping state law mm -hmm. and how they are ruling on the abortion cases before them. That will give us an indication of where they might like land. Bellwether. Um, mm -hmm. This is, this is an Anne story. If Anne was here, she would be reporting it <laughs> because it's the National Indie Excellence Award. Ooh. This is a literary award, and yes. it is specifically for independent authors and titles published by small to medium size imprints across all genres. Mm. 
And in the LGBTQ plus fiction category, the winner might have been a Vermont resident, Gail Marlene Schwartz for nice. Falling Through the Night. Okay, we got to put that on our list and, and put that on our list for the book club. And the novel explores the complicated journey of healing trauma and learning how to love. Mm. And it's available both online and our, in our local bookstores. Oh, nice. Support our local vendors because they're doing the LGBTQ plus reading club that if you sign up, such as at Bear Pond Books here in Montpelier, there's a donation that gets made to Outright Vermont. Oh, that's amazing. So, that's great. Harvard Union High School. Oh, I heard about this. The middle of the night. Ridiculous. And they've got... That's my They've got thing. photos. And it's obvious that these people knew about the cameras and knew what they were doing because they were hooded. They mm -hmm. took down the American and the pride flag. They stole the pride flag and put the American flag back up. And apparently Harvard for the last three years has displayed the progress flag mm -hmm. during Pride Month. And mm -hmm. their superintendent says, we're already in the process of getting a new one, and it will go up. We will not be deterred. Mm. And the state police are actively investigating, and they have a tip line. Oh. So if you know anything about this or who might have done it, please share that information. Um, now we're going to talk about veterans. And there are three different stories. Mm -hmm. The first one is there was a suit that was filed on behalf of veterans who had had a dishonorable discharge mm -hmm. because of their sexual orientation, the lavender scare, mm -hmm. don't ask, don't, don't tell. tell. Yep. And they were saying that the process that the Veterans Administration had put in place to appeal that dishonorable discharge is so cumbersome and so burdensome that as you were reporting in the story mm -hmm. about Namibia, that the overall impact of having your name show up on this list, what it does to the rest of your life. Yeah. And the Department of Justice said, oh, no, 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 there was nothing discriminatory. Well, what they were saying, is they, were, they were making it really protracted and requiring so right. much documentation that years were going by while these cases were That may be what I was just about to say. <laughs> I love you. Sorry. No, it's, but the what same. the Department of Justice was trying to say is that their process it's, was not yeah. discriminatory right. and it was the same as any other. Yeah. Well, the judge said, I don't think so, and dismissed the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss the case. Mm -hmm. so, so it's going forward. But it may not be necessary because actually this morning, yeah. as we were taping, Hot off the presses. Joe Biden issued a pardon for anyone who was discharged under the, its um, ba -ba -ba, Article 125. And the form that you had to complete to reverse your dishonorable discharge was DD214. So anyone who's a veteran will recognize that. But he said, you know, the way we treated veterans had been an active process since 1951, that in 2011, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was finally repealed. The military changed their protocol so that it was no longer a dishonorable discharge based on sexual, sexual orientation. It had to be due to a forced sexual encounter. Mm. So what Biden is saying is you get, a, you get a pardon, which means that these veterans will now be eligible for lost pay, lost benefits. Benefits, yeah, that's a big and, deal. And education, education is a piece of it. Education, reimbursement, all that stuff. And they're yeah. thinking that it's over 35,000 people that fall in that category. That will be included by that. Huh. But Tammy Baldwin. Yes. Did you see this? <laughs> I did. She didn't let us down. She and Tim Kaine again, have sponsored you know, a, an apology for how we were treated. 
or how veterans were treated, the lavender scare, don't ask, don't mm -hmm. tell. You know, anyone who serves our country, whether they are in uniform or a civil servant, deserves to be treated with respect, fairness, and dignity, regardless of who they are or who they love. And this was from Tammy Baldwin. I'm proud to lead this effort to show our commitment to creating a more accepting, equal country that lives up to our nation's ideals. So the resolution addresses the lavender scare, scare and the don't ask, don't tell era with tens of thousands were given a dishonorable discharge because of orientation. Or the lavender scare, a lot of civil servants were fired well, no, from their exactly. jobs, so they weren't necessarily all military. As you said, civil servants as well were Are often summarily in dismissed with no cause. Yeah. So we'll be looking to see what happens with that. Florida? Yes. The, the federal district that court <laughs> has permanently blocked Florida from enforcing a law that bans medical care for transgender adolescents and restricts it for transgender adults. I love that. So looking love at that. some of these other cases mm -hmm. going forward, that Again, sets a yeah. good, good precedent. Yep. And you talked about um, Middleborough, Massachusetts, with the T-shirt and you know, creating a disruptive environment. We're still watching the bills in New Hampshire. Is there it, were still going on. They were sent. Well, no, they were passed by the legislature and sent to Governor Sununu, mm -hmm. and he has neither vetoed nor signed them. Mm. So I keep going and looking to find mm. out what's happening with them, because in Vermont. If, if Phil Scott didn't sign a bill within a certain period of time, it became law without his signature. Mm. I don't know if New Hampshire has the same provision. Do we know what the length of time is? That was the next part. Mm. I know in Vermont it's not actually all that long. You can see why people You've, would do that politically, because they didn't, may not want to go on record as veto, actively vetoing but just accepting that. But I'd be curious what the time It'll be is. interesting. Because these are, I, most of these are transgender related and transgender in sports. Mm -hmm. So, Louisiana, did you see this? The guy, they passed a bill that each public school has to display the Ten Commandments because Moses oh. was the, you know, it, it, was the first you know, was he from Louisiana? I don't recall. Uh, there we are. <laughs> well, as the governor is signing That's the right. law and promoting how wonderful this will be for our youth, oh. the youth standing behind him fainted, needed med needed active medical attention, wow. and he absolutely ignored the youth. Wow! And the commentary that came in afterwards is like, what was he thinking, ignoring the, you know, an active medical situation behind him? And Is know, that one of the Ten Commandments? I, I'm thinking Thou it, shalt it ignore must your, be. <laughs> you know, you, your fellow man. But the commentators were, That's a, his comment was, if you want to respect the rule of law, you got to go from the original lawgiver, which was Moses. Oh. So that was it. But this was, this was the commentary from people afterwards is, we should take the incident as an omen. If ever there was a sign from God that his so-called followers are on the wrong path, this would be it. I love that. Okay. I love that reframing of the, of the situation. And my final, <laughs> yes, because I, d I couldn't resist the headlines and how it was promoted, it was, we're giving you a little eye candy. Oh, well, that drew your attention right away. Uh, on Hulu. Oh. Matt Bomber. Okay. Is going to star in a Golden Girls like sitcom. With men? With Nathan. L yeah. No, no, no. It's a queer. Yes. Because. I love that. He may be starring opposite Nathan Lane. <sighs> That would be amazing. And it may include 
our ally Linda Lavin, who I adore. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it may be called Mid Century Modern. Oh. So okay. be on the lookout for it because I, I didn't I didn't see when it was going to air, huh. but it's coming from gay executive producer Ryan Murphy and Will and Grace creator David Cohen. Oh, so, all right. So the answer to our trivia question. 1992, that may have been in response to the passage of S-131, which was a bill to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. The lead sponsor was the Democratic senator from Rutland County, David Walk. There was a companion House version that when the Senate version really got traction, didn't get pushed. And the lead sponsor of that was Republican Representative by Lugan Buell of South Burlington. The signing of the bill, there were death threats that went into Howard Dean's office. And it was the first time that the state police felt that they needed to bring the German shepherds in to sort of sniff and screen all of the activity that was going on and his security detail had provisions that if something were to happen, how those of us, myself included, who were standing directly behind the governor would respond or not respond. So with that, <laughs> we've used up virtually all yes, our time. Yes, we have. Yeah, yes. We need to say resist. resist.